Daniel to the book of Daniel, chapter 9, and we're going to try our best to finish up this this morning because I think last week I got a little sidetracked and went on to another situation situation. That's easy to do because one thing leads you into another in Bible study. It's hard to stay with the text sometimes because of what's written. But in Daniel chapter 9, the most important uh, chapter in the Bible concerning prophetic word, uh, we, we went over his, his prayer and then found out last week in our studies that while he was praying, uh, before he even finished his prayer, uh, God sent Gabriel to him to give him a word. Now, I think it's very interesting that when uh, in the book of Daniel, as you go through the book of Daniel, you'll discover that Nebuchadnezzar was the first person to have dreams and not being able to understand them. God gave Daniel the revelation to the dream. And so he was able to tell Nebuchadnezzar what God was trying to say to him uh, through that, that first set of dreams. And then here we are, Daniel has had dreams and God gave him the instruction about these dreams. And now um, Daniel is asking God, God uh, Daniel had this dream here that we've talked about and he couldn't understand it. Even after ha being given the understanding about these other dreams, he couldn't understand this dream. So he prays and seeks God's guidance in this matter and God sends Gabriel to him and here's what he says. He says, uh, I'm come to show thee and to inform thee and, and give you skill and understanding. Now, verse 24 is where we stopped last week. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Now, first of all, let's make the, let's make the uh, uh, statement and the understanding that we're talking about something that is in the days of Daniel, of course, was to the Jewish people only. They were the ones in bondage. They were the ones in captivity. They were God's chosen people and still are. Uh, they're Daniel's people. He says, uh, they're determined upon thy people and the holy city. So the holy city would be Jerusalem. So what we're going to discover here today about the 70 weeks, that primarily this has to do with Israel, the Jewish people. Now notice he said, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Now I think I've already mentioned this a time or two, but in order to understand this, you've got to understand a biblical week. Now a week that we know is seven days. A biblical week in the Bible is more than just a seven day time period. And I went back into the book of Genesis, I think at this point, and talked to you about how Jacob worked for his first wife um, he thought he was getting Rachel. He didn't get Rachel. He got Leah because she was the firstborn. It wasn't ethical that Laban would give the baby daughter first and not give Leah in marriage first. So Jacob worked seven years that he said fulfill her week. Now the word, and I'm going to write this on the board so that if you're taking notes, it'll be easy for you to, to, to write it just like that. But a biblical week we're going to call it a biblical week, B-I-B-I-C-A-L. Is that right, Sue? Yes. I did? You all know what it is, though, don't you? It is seven years. Seven years. He said 70 weeks. Now, 70 weeks. Okay, let's go from there. I'm going to do this. In, in very simplistic form so that, now this is hard to be understood unless you're familiar with it. Okay, so seven years to, for a week, a biblical week of seven years. And he said there's going to be 70 of these weeks. Are you with me? So let's do some math. How many is good at math? 70 times seven is how many? 490 what? Years. 490 years, okay? Now, this was for the Jewish people of that time that were in captivity. Why did God say 70 weeks are determined upon thy people? Seven times, that's 490 years. And we got to start with the base of 490 years. 
Now, they stayed in captivity for 70 years, of course. And then he goes on to tell what's going to happen. We went over that last week. Now, when does this 490 years start? Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks. Okay, are you with me? Now, go back, if you want to turn back to Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. The book of Nehemiah, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah are great books in understanding the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of the wall, the street, the city, and so on. And in Nehemiah, and let me give you a little bit about Nehemiah. He was a, he was a really a great man. He was the son. His father's name was Hachaiah. What a name. I'm glad my dad's name was only Herman. That was easy to understand. But I never did call my dad by his first name. I never did. That was, that was taboo in our family. We didn't do that. We never did do that. I called him Daddy or Dad. Now, uh, his brothers come to him. He's, uh, Nehemiah is the wine taster for the king. That was his job. What he did when they prepared the food for the king, he got to taste it and drink a drink of the wine that the king was drinking. And if it didn't kill him, then that food was served to the king. So uh, he was the wine taster. That's what his job was. And he was sort of like the court jester. He had to come in to court and have a big smile on his face and a jovial attitude. He had to come in and be happy. And if he wasn't and they saw there was something wrong with him, according to the laws, the, the, the Babylonian law was, the king could order that his head be taken off immediately. He could have been taken out and killed because that was part of his job he was supposed to do. It. So when his brothers come to visit him, uh, the Bible tells us, and I'm just paraphrasing here for the sake of time, uh, he says, how are things back home? How are things going back home? Uh, they say, not very good. And here's what they tell him. If, if you want to uh, read it, I'll read it to you. Uh, they said, the remnant that are left of the captivity that are in the province, they're, number one, they're in great affliction, and the province uh, and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, the gates thereof are burned with fire. And he said, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And so as he began to pray, and this prayer of his is one sort of like Daniel's prayer is, it's awesome, it's a prayer that uh, you can read and study to learn about biblical praying. And when he hears this news and he gets up under a burden, uh, he was a broken man, but he was a burdened man. And so he, he says, uh, uh, Lord, I want you to do something about this. Be careful how you pray for God to send somebody. He, you'll be the person he sends usually. I'm seriously telling you that. You say, Lord, I want you to send somebody to witness to my uh, unsaved person. He's going to send you to, to do that job. Uh, be careful about how you pray a lot, about a lot of things because God might be calling on you. And so here's what the Bible said that when he went in before the king and the king, they wanted to know, said, what's wrong with you? Uh, why are you so sad? What's, what's your problem here? Uh, are, thou, are you sick? There's sorrow in your heart. You can read this in chapter 2. And so that's his cue. That's, that's his opening. And so when the king wants to know about why he's so burdened and sad and downhearted and all this, he tells the king, he said, listen, verse 5, he said, uh, If thy servant have found favor in thy sight, I want you to send me back unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that would be Jerusalem, that I may build it again. And so the king and queen are sitting there, and the king says to him, well, how long is this trip going to be for you? Uh, notice in verse number 6. So when he, they converse about this. Now, keep in mind in your Bible, not everything that goes on is written in your Bible. The Bible is not a history book. It's an inspired book of God. And the theme of the Bible is Jesus and His redemption for mankind. It's not the history of everything that goes on. 
Some people, when they read the Bible, they don't read between the lines. This, this wasn't all the king and ne Nehemiah said. That's all the Bible records that was said, but they had a conversation about this situation. The king is, is talking to him, and he's, he's uh, asking questions and finding out about this situation. So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. So he gave the king time, and he said, Listen, I want more than just to go. I want you, not to, I want you to send me. I want you to supply me. And then he said, I want you to give me the security that I need. Notice this. He said, uh, I want you to, uh, the king said, Well, I'm going to give a letter to the keeper of the king's forest so that they can cut these trees down. They can make beams for you when you build, uh, need the lumber, they need the beams and so on. And uh, the king granted all this, and this was in the hand of God, the will of God, because he said, the good hand of my God was upon me. And so he goes to Jerusalem. Now, in chapter 2, uh, here, here's what the, the edict of the king is. Um, and here's, here's what we're going to use and what... All conservative Bible scholars down through the years have used this to start this time period of 490 years. Uh, it's Nehemiah. I want you to look at this. Nehemiah uh, chapter 2. The king orders this, that he would go to Jerusalem. Now, this is in the year of 445 B.C., and it's actually on March the 14th, according to ancient Jewish writings. So I want to write this down for you. On March the 14th, the year 445 B.C. is when the edict or the order was by King Artaxerxes, also known as Ahasuerus, to rebuild the temple Restore the Jerusalem, rebuild Jerusalem, the temple and the wall and so forth. This is where this starts. Okay, now, that's what the Bible says in Daniel chapter 9. It begins with the, the order of the king. I think it's in my Bible. I lost it. What's wrong with me this morning? I th did I not read that in my Bible? I think I did. You all know that I did? Well, you all are dry this morning, aren't you? What's going on? Nobody's responding. What's happening? It's a beautiful fall day out there. Oh, I guess you got frostbitten. Anyway, here's what he said. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand, so we've got to understand this, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. Seven weeks of years is 490 years. So from, the, from, from this point here to the coming of the Messiah will be 490 years. Look what he says. The street shall be built again and the wall in troublesome times and then after three score and two weeks the Messiah will be cut off. So, from here to here is going to be 69 weeks. Then, the Bible said three score. How much is a score? 20 years. Three times 20 is what? 60. And then he says two more years is to be added to that. You got that? That's 62 years. So take 69. This is a minus. And what do we have? We have 7. Have you got it? Are y'all writing this down? Oh, you're trying to. So you've got 69 weeks and then 62 weeks. And you, you, do, you uh, subtract this and then you've got 7 weeks which it means seven years of great tribulation. That's why we say the great tribulation will last seven years. This is taken right here from Daniel chapter 9. Now, do you, do you realize that according to history, right here is when 
This edict of the king was ordered and given. March the 14th, 445 B.C. According to Sir Robin Anderson, who was a, a, an Englishman who was great with numbers and math and a great Bible scholar, I uh, have uh, two of his books in my library, Sir Robin Anderson. He, he went back, and of course there was also an Anglican rector named Usher, and if you've got a good study Bible that's got the dates at the top of your Bible, the years, mine does. I don't know if yours does or not. It'll, it, they use Usher's calculations on years. Do you know the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem? on the donkey to present himself as king to the people, the Jewish people, was on March the 14th. Are you with me? 62 weeks of years after this, March the 14th, and it falls sometime around 30 to 33 A.D., I mean B.C. <laughs> when did I write A.D.? Because I'm not paying much attention. Jesus was, when he was crucified, does anybody know how old he was? 33 and a half years, technically speaking. So, do you know that God keeps good time? Now, when, when Jesus was presented as king to the people of Israel, did they receive him or reject him? They rejected him. He rode in on a little donkey that day. And they rejected him. So three score and two weeks, and then after three score and two weeks, the Messiah would be cut off. Now the word cut off actually is the same word that we would call in the New Testament would be crucified. This is the time element. This brings it all up, this 62 weeks, brings it up to the time that Messiah would be cut off. See, to, to Daniel, listen, Gabriel said to him, I'm going to give you skill and understanding. I'm going to tell you. Now, I want to go back and I want to say something, and it may be difficult for many people to receive this. But God in his foreknowledge knows the end from the beginning with everything that's going to go on. If God does not have that kind of knowledge, he can't be the supernatural being that he is. God knows what I'm going to have for lunch next week at this same time. I don't know. Probably what I have will be too much because you can tell, right? You better not say amen on that. You better say, Brother Larry, no, it's not that way. But anyway, God has foreknowledge of everything that's going to happen. By the way, God has decreed already everything that's going to happen in the rest of time. It's in his mind, listen, I've explained it to you in a most simplistic way that if, if you watch the part of the parade that passes you, but if you're up above the parade, you see the starting and you see the ending of it. You see it all. And see, in God's mind, everything that's supposed to happen is, is already a finished work in eternity. When Jesus Christ hung on the cross and cried, Father, it is finished, the redemptive plan of God in the mind of God was a completed work right that very moment when Jesus died. So everything that, listen, God already sees you as his bride in heaven. He knows how many is going to be in the bride. There won't be any, any, there won't be any empty plates at the marriage supper. He knows all this stuff. He's God. There won't be any empty mansions of some believer that didn't make it. God knows this stuff. I hope you see this. Because, see, most preachers preach a little bitty God. I don't. I preach a great, almighty God with all knowledge, all power, all wisdom. He knows everything there is to know. The Bible said He knows what I'm going to think before I ever think it. Uh, the psalmist said he knows my thoughts even from afar off. God knew the very moment I would be born. He, knew every, he knows everything about me. 
And the amazing thing is, he knows all my faults. Well, he doesn't see my faults now, but he knows that I have faults. He knows that I'm not perfect. And he still loves me in spite of all of that. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. But see, when you got saved, every, your, your entire life was placed under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you don't have to, listen, you don't have to worry about God ever kicking you out of the family because you are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Now, I know some people don't see that, but I've, I found that in the Bible. There's no such thing as a believer not going to heaven. But if you're really a true born-again child of God, you are already incorporated into the bride of Christ and you'll be there. He may have to drag you across the finish line, but you'll be there. You'll be there. Amen. Now let's get back to what we're saying. Messiah is going to be cut off. And then from the time that Messiah is cut off, that would be the crucifixion, till the second coming, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you know the return of, the, of Jesus or the Messiah is in two phases. Y'all, are y'all still with me? If you are, shake your head so I can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. The first part of the second coming of Jesus is called, we call it the rapture. If you want to be technical about it, the word rapture is not really in your Bible. It's a, it's a Latin term that means to be caught up with great joy, delight, um, ecstasy. That's when the church is going to be raptured out, but then uh, then between the rapture and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is approximately seven years. And that's what we're talking about here. The difference between 69 and 62 is seven years. See, the time frame between the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and the consummation of the bride, and only God knows when that's going to take place. There's no such thing as a human being knowing how much time is going to be involved between the time that he died on the cross and gave his life, the crucifixion, when he was cut off. Uh, he stayed in the tomb for three days and three nights. He came forth. And then, of course, we know that 50 days later was the, the feast of Passover, or pa uh, Pentecost, and he told his disciples to wait and the Holy Spirit came on the Feast of Pentecost. And by the way, that wasn't a one-time feast. That was carried on every year and is still being carried on by the Orthodox Jews every year. Uh, there's some churches that, that teach, you know, that Pentecost was... No, Pentecost is still being carried on among the Jewish people. It's 50 days after the Passover. And by the way, do you know what the fall feasts are that's being carried on now? Do you realize that... Just a few weeks ago, we had the Feast of Trumpets. That lasts for two days. Why two days? It's a different day on the calendar every year because no man knows the day of the hour when Jesus is going to come. And the Feast of Trumpets it represents the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Trumpets are going to be blown. Uh, I'm telling you what I believe. I believe that the fall feast will be fulfilled exactly at the time and the day as the spring feast have already been fulfilled. Jesus Christ died on the very day that, that of Passover. He was a Passover lamb. And so we, that's a study within itself. Uh, the feast, listen, the day of atonement is being observed right now. It's, it's the day when they believe the gates of heaven are open and they believe that's what there's going to, that you have to have a week of repentance and we could go into all that. The books are, are looked at to see what life people are living and so on. And they call their people to repentance during that time. And, it's, it's called, and in the Old Testament days, uh, under the law of Moses, the Day of Atonement was the holiest day of the year. And that's when the, the great high priest went in behind the veil with the blood of the animal that, that was slain for the sins of all the people of Israel. And he went in behind the veil and offered the blood on the mercy seat, sprinkled it seven times on the mercy seat. He first went in with an offering for uh, blood for his own sins, and then he went back in to, to, and carried the blood to offer on behalf of the people. And do you, know, do you know ancient Jewish writings say that they put a rope around his ankle? So that, that's not in the Bible, but that's in ancient Jewish writings that if God was to strike him dead, if he didn't, wasn't fully qualified to do what he was supposed to do, and God struck him dead in, there, in that situation, 
they could pull him out with the rope because no other person was allowed in behind that veil. It was such a holy place. And um, that's, where the, that's where the Mosque of Omar sits today is on the foundation stone of the, the world, according to the Jewish belief. And it's the stone where Abraham offered Isaac and Mount Moriah is a place where Jesus offered himself on the altar of the cross. And so you're getting, you're getting it all full today, aren't you? Amen. But I'm telling you that all this has significance. Everything that was done in the Old Testament was a type and shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ who would come. The Old Testament looks forward to Jesus and his death and burial and resurrection. The New Testament looks back to Jesus. We look back to the cross and what was accomplished at the cross for our salvation, our redemption, the promises of God. They're all in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's made, made unto us wisdom and righteousness. See, if you have Jesus, listen, God doesn't see you. I don't care how much of a failure you think you are. And you know, the devil wants you to believe that you're nothing, you're a nobody, you've failed so much. God's, uh, you know, he's disappointed. God's not one bit disappointed because if God could be disappointed, he couldn't be a perfect God. Are you with me? God knew you and God saved you and he knew you would fail. That's why Jesus died on the cross to cover all your sins that you would ever commit. The sins I commit next week that I don't even know I'm going to commit. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody comes short of the glory of God. Jesus has already paid for all those sins at the cross. How many of your sins were future when he died? You tell me. Every one of them was. So don't, don't be walking around here and saying, well, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make it or not. I just don't know. Lord, please help. Listen, I've got blessed assurance Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory is mine. I'd hate to think that I lived a life to where I had no peace in my heart, not knowing I was saved. I asked a lady here a while back, and you know, every day I find somebody that I can witness to if I'm out among people. And if I'm by myself, I witness to myself. But... I had three grandkids that came over yesterday. They're out of school, so my wife had arranged. She was off from work. It was Columbus Day. The uh, post office has every holiday in the book, you know, they, and so on. And so she said, Sunday night, she said, you know, I've made arrangements that the, the three kids, Derek's three kids, are going to come down and spend the afternoon with us. And I said, well, I've already got plans to work. I'm sorry. Well, she said, You're not, we've not been with those kids in a month. And she said, I'm, I just want to see him. I want to be with him. I said, what are you going to do with him? She said, I'm going to play with him, and I'm going to have a good time with him. It's going to be a nice, warm fall day. And she said, we'll take him out to eat. I said, we will. We will. We will take him out to eat. We, we, we. You've got my life planned for me. We, we, we. So guess what Papa had to do? He had to open up his wallet yesterday and buy meals for five people at burritos or barberitos, whatever you call it, because that's where they wanted to go eat. And we had a great time, and so I went back to get me a, a glass of tea, and uh, I saw there was a young lady there, and she was making more tea to put it in, and pouring sugar in it and all that stuff. And, and I said, well, I see you're, and I, I just start chatting with people, and I said, well, I see you're making tea. And she said, yeah, and, and we were talking, and I said, well, I like tea, and so on and so forth, and just trying to get to the point where I wanted to talk to her about Jesus. And so I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting there, and then I said, you know, I said, um, uh, you seem to be a very intelligent young lady. I said, can I ask you a personal question? And she said, sure. See, that opened the door for me when I told her how intelligent she was because uh, I, want, I want her to know that intelligent people know Jesus because the Bible said it's the fool that has said in his heart there is no God. God calls people foolish if they don't know Jesus. That's what God calls them. And I said, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? And she looked at me and she said, you know, you're the first person that's ever asked me this since I've been here, but I do. I am a believer. And I said, you know, I think you are too. Because I said, in talking to you, I said, I just felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit. And I said, he has confirmed in my spirit that you are a child of God as well. And I said, I want to tell you my story. And I began to share with her about how God had raised me up from a deathbed when I was in the hospital. And you know what that girl started doing? Tears started coming out of her face. 
and she said, I am so glad you shared with this with me today because and she began to tell me why that she was glad I had talked to her. Well, I talked to her there for a few minutes. It wasn't a long time, but then I went back to the table. And they were there eating, you know, and my little granddaughter, Josie, she's nine years old. She said, well, Papa, did you find somebody over there you wanted to talk to? I said, yes. What were you all talking about? I said, matter of fact, I was talking to this girl about Jesus. Well, she said, Papa, you could come over here to the table and talk to us about Jesus so we could eat. <laughs> it was so funny. It was just comical. But we had a great time. I told, them, I told my kids, of course, now she's nine, her, her other little sister's seven, and then their brother's four. And he could care less about Jesus as far as anything like that. He's just a little boy, and he was, he was making him a paper airplane and flying it, you know. And he had me to make him a paper airplane, and we flew it back and forth there in Barbaritos and, you know, playing around. And, and they like to play with Papa and Nana because we play with them. And uh, they told me one day we were out at my house, you know, I've got a real flat yard there in the back, and we get out there and play. And, and they said, this is the first time we've ever saw you down in the grass. And, of course, when I... I, you know, we were kicking, playing kickball and stuff, and I'm, I got down in the grass. Well, guess who got on top of me? They all got on top of me because they had to, you know, be like that. But going back, I try to, if I'm out among people, I try to find somebody that I can talk to about Jesus. And um, it's not been too long ago. I was at McDonald's, and I was able to lead a young man to the Lord there because I opened the door, started talking to him about Jesus, and he was from Florida. And he said, my grandparents were saved people, and they told me about Jesus when I was growing up. And I had prayer with him right beside the door of my car. He stood there, and I had prayer with him and asked him to pray with me the sinner's prayer. And he received Jesus Christ as his own personal Savior. If I had never taken time to talk to him, he may have never gotten saved in his life. That was an appointment that I had that God had for me to, to lead that man to the Lord. Now, folks... I want to tell you something. Our job as Christians is not just to come to church on Sunday morning. It's to be a witness out here in the world. It's to be a witness to those we come in contact with. And uh, you're not going to be able to win everybody to the Lord, but there's going to be somebody you can tell about Jesus. And, uh, you know, it's important that we do that. Well, let's get back to what we were saying here. Then the rapture and the return of the Lord, there's a basically about seven years between those two events, and that's called the Great Tribulation. Now, uh, the first part of the Tribulation is going to be the milder part of the Tribulation. It's all going to be Tribulation, but the last three and a half years is when you're going to see the worst part of the Great Tribulation. Now, I'm a pre-trib Bible believer. Some people aren't. Some people are mid-trib. Some people are post-trib. Some people are post-millennial. Um, I'm so pre, I don't even eat post-toasties anymore. Okay, you got it. Some of you did, anyway. But I'm here to tell you, and what I was going to say, the reason why all of this could be given by Gabriel to Daniel, because Gabriel is a messenger angel from heaven. In the Bible, he get, he's the angel that God uses to give messages to people. Uh, what was one of the greatest messages he ever brought to a little maiden called Mary. And he told her, said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and, and that holy thing that is born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That's the greatest message he ever brought. But why could Gabriel, in the book of Daniel, thousands of years before the Lord Jesus Christ, how could Gabriel give this word to Daniel because God has already got this whole thing mapped out from eternity to eternity. Eternity past to eternity future. God knows the end from the beginning. It's all mapped out. So um, it's important for us to see this. Now, the Bible said that Messiah would be cut off, not for himself, and, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, I'm going to have to take some of this off for you. To have a place. Now, the people of the prince, the people that the Bible says they're the prince that's going to come, and they're going to destroy the city. This happened in the year of A.D. 70. 
That's when Jerusalem was bombarded. Now, you remember in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, if you want to turn to this in Matthew chapter 24, you will remember that uh, Jesus and His disciples are there, and they ask Him a question in Matthew 24. They said, uh, uh, they're, they're coming out of the temple there, and they, they show Jesus and talk to Jesus about all these buildings of the temple. And at that time, see, Herod had spent 43 years building on to, the, to this temple, and he had reinforced the, the stone wall that held the, the dirt up and all that. And I don't have time to tell you all that. I'm getting ready to do a, a more thorough study on the temple than I ever have before. I'm getting all my information. I'm going to teach on the temple somewhere, probably this winter. But uh, I've had a group of people, in fact, I had my wife and I were in Johnson, we were in Irwin uh, Saturday afternoon when she got off from work. We drove over to Irwin to the Apple Festival. We like to go over there to that. And my family had a, a booth over there. They were selling stuff. And I'd built some wooden crates for them to sell out of some popper strips and stuff that I had. So we went over there to be with them. And uh, there was w three people came up. I hadn't seen this one lady in about seven, eight years. And she said, why don't you start a Bible study in Kingsport somewhere at night where we can come to it? She's the fourth person that's asked me that, so I think that might be of God, don't you? I think it'd be God's will for a group of people to study the Bible on a weekly night somewhere. But anyway, uh, they said they wanted to study and learn about some things that they weren't hearing anywhere else. And I said, well, I'll be the one to give it to you because... Uh, preachers who preach on Sunday mornings don't have time to talk to you about the temple and the tabernacle and stuff like that. They've got other things they need to address as a pastor. But Jesus, in Matthew 24, as, as they are talking about the temple and the furnishings and how elaborate... And by the way, Herod tried to impress the Jewish people. Now, Herod was not a, a full Jew. He was an Edomite. He was the descendant of Edom who was Esau, and of course he was not the covenant that was not made to Abraham, Esau, and Jacob. It was made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob being the recipient instead of Esau, his brother Esau. So uh, they're looking at the temple here, and here's what Jesus says in verse 2. He says, Verily, I, and the word verily means truly, I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So he has given a prophetic word here to his disciples that all these great and mighty stones that they see are going to be ultimately cast down. That happened when Titus, the Roman general, came through. In Rome, they were, they were in warfare and, and so on. And the, so he comes to Jerusalem, and there's a battle that goes on for four years. Four years. The Roman army encamps round about Jerusalem and in the vicinity of Jerusalem for four long years. And in AD 70, they break through and they kill people, slaughter people, ravish the women. Uh, Josephus in his writings say that they either slaughtered or sold into slavery 100,000 Jews. Jesus has prophesied this would take place. Because the temple inside was overlaid with gold, they thought that between the stones of the temple was gold. So they took every stone and cast it down. Jesus said this would happen. He said there would not be one stone left upon another. That was fulfilled in A.D. 70. Okay, from A.D. 70 on... Jerusalem was a destructed city. It was torn all apart. It was burned with fire. The walls were, were destroyed. The uh, city itself was uh, left in ruins by the... And by the way, there were... At that time, there were a thousand Jews, I know you've heard of this, who were zealots and... They, they went from the city of Jerusalem. They all got together. They went out to a place called Masada. Has anybody ever heard of Masada? Masada was a fortress 
that Herod had built on top of a mountain. And he said that no one would ever be able to go there or get up there. A thousand of these Jews said they went and there was food stored there and they stayed there until the Roman army built a dirt ramp to where they could get up the side of that mountain on. And when they got to the top, they found out that there was only two or three people alive that had hidden themselves. The rest of them had all killed each other rather than being placed as a slave or killed by the Romans. Uh, it's called Masada. There's been movies made about it. I know you've seen them or heard about them. The, and if you ever get to go to, did you get to go to Masada? I'm sure you did when you went. So we didn't get to go. Our, the guy that was over our tour group said he'd been there 40 times and he said, it's hot down there. I don't feel like going today. And so we didn't get to go. Even though we'd paid all that money to go on the trip, we didn't get to see a lot of the stuff because he didn't care. All he cared about was getting his, t his, his cut out of it because every shop we went into, those Jewish men that run those shops and stuff, they would bow down to him and they, would, they knew his name. They knew who he was. He'd been there so much. And when we got done shopping and everything, they slipped a little something in his hand. And on the flight back, he showed me about three diamond rings that he'd gotten that trip because he brought 40 people into shop with those shopkeepers, you know. And they paid him and took care of him. I'm going to start going to Israel like that. I'll be a wealthy man, won't I, when it's all over. Of course, I'm too old to start that stuff now. I'm 71 years old. I'll probably never be back in Israel. I'd like to go, but... I probably never will until Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom. And I'm going to be a part of it. I'm going to be there then. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, have you learned anything about the time element? This, this, this scripture, listen, this scripture of, of uh, Daniel has partially been fulfilled. But there's still yet more to be fulfilled. Are you, are you understanding what I'm telling you? Not all of it has been fulfilled at this point. Because, listen, we've got two more chapters. We've got three more visions to go through. So I want to encourage you to read ahead. And uh, let's get started in chapter 10. Uh, well, well, we'll finish up here on chapter 9. My time is gone, just about it. Um, the prince that shall come to destroy the city, the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now, like I say, that part of it was fulfilled in A.D. 70. Then in verse 27, he shall confirm. Now, the he is important. He is not talking about Messiah or Daniel or any other human being other than the Antichrist himself. He's going to confirm a covenant with many for one week. And that's the one week that is known as the seven-year tribulation period. Seven years makes up a biblical week of great tribulation. Okay, he's going to, when the Antichrist comes, by the way, I'm convinced he's in the world today. I have no doubt about that. I, and I, I watch a program and I receive a monthly magazine called Prophecy Watchers. Does anybody here know what I'm talking about? Do you, you, have you ever watched that program on TV or have it? Where you can access it. If you do, you ought to. These men keep up with all the current events of prof prophetic things as they correspond with Scripture. And it's very interesting. I tape it all the time, and then when I have time, I go back and watch it. A lot of times after Jeannie goes to bed at 9.30, I sit up to 11 o'clock watching my tape programs and taking notes down from them because she has to get, well, she had to get up at 5 o'clock this morning and go out because she had to be on the job by 6 a.m. And so... Uh, I don't want to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. I'd rather stay up late at night and study if I'm not too tired rather than get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and do it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I love to study, but I don't love to study that well to where I want to get up at 4 o'clock when I've gotten into bed at midnight. I need about five hours of sleep a night. I've been going on five hours of sleep at, for 30 years, and so that's what I'm used to. So this morning I had my clock set for 630 and I woke up at 5 till 6, so I went ahead and got up and, and saw how beautiful I was and how much I needed to do to be more beautiful. And that took a long time. I mean, that, I didn't get to the gym till 8 o'clock this morning. I usually am there between 7.30 and 8. But see, it took a lot more work to get me looking good so I'd be presentable to you all today. Uh, I had to get all my hairs lined up to cover that spot. It takes a while when you've only got three 
to try to weave them around. I'm, I'm, I tell you, it's hard to do. See, some of you guys don't know how tough it is on us bald-headed people. Ladies, if you ever start getting bald, you won't laugh at me because I do all this. I mean, listen, I do the best I can. One of my little grandkids told me the other day, he said, Papa, you're going to have to start wearing a cap. I said, why? Because you're bald-headed. <laughs> it's good when your kids recognize it, you know what I'm saying? So the Antichrist is going to confirm the covenant. He's going to make a covenant with Israel. Now, I want to tell you something, folks. There's things happening in, the, in Israel. Uh, you, would be, you would be amazed at what's going on, but there's things happening. And in the midst of the week, that means in the middle of the week, He's going to cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and the overspreading of abominations. He shall make it desolate. Now, this is what Daniel spoke to us about earlier about the abomination of desolation. Matthew 24, again, Jesus mentions the abomination of desolation. And in the middle of the week of the tribulation period, the sacrifice and oblation. See, now listen. In understanding this, we believe that there's going to be a tribulational temple built. I told you the stones have already been cut. They tried to take the cornerstone up on the Mount Moriah to sanctify it and anoint it, and the police stopped them from doing that. I have a video that shows them doing that. We are so close to the coming of the Lord that people in the, in the U.S. don't even know how close we are. Uh, the Jewish people know more about that. They are right now praying for Messiah to come. And here's what they believe. They believe when they get the temple built... And I heard the Sham Richman, who's the chief high priest there, he said, it's time for us to do something rather than to talk about it. That's what he said two weeks ago. And so that's what this ashes of the red heifer and stuff is going to be about. And so uh, things are moving quickly. When, when things begin to move, they start moving fast in prophecy. And so we're closer to the coming of the Lord than anybody's ever been since he left Mount Olives and went back to heaven. And he said, in like manner as you've seen me go into heaven, I will return. And so he's coming back. And it won't be long. It won't be much longer. So uh, this covenant that the Antichrist will make with Israel will be a superficial covenant. It will not be something that will last very long. It will only last about three and a half years. Then in the middle of that covenant, he's going to break it with them. He's going to set himself up as God in the temple, the Bible said. By the way, this is it. Paul wrote about this in the book of Thessalonians. I'm going to give you this and I'm going to close because our time is over. We can only keep John in here for the time we need him. Amen. So he's, he's great. He's awesome. He knows what he's doing. He's very, very uh, intelligent and knows what he's doing. And and here's what the Bible says in the book of 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin, that would be the Antichrist, be revealed the son of perdition. Now before the Antichrist can be revealed, there has to be the time of apostasy, or apostasia is what it's known in the Greek language of falling away. All the conservative Bible scholars and preachers that I've had any dealings with over the past 25 years tell me that we are now in that time, the time of the falling away. When I was a kid, you can announce revival, churches would be full of people. You announce a revival today, there's not going to be very many even show up. We're in the day of the falling away. And so we might as well expect that because it's here. And then he goes on to talk about this, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The spirit of Antichrist is already at work in the world, folks. That's why you're seeing the sinfulness, the wickedness, the ungodliness that's going on among the peoples of the world because the spirit of Antichrist has preceded his personal uh, person and personality already at work in the world. And only he who now leteth, the word let there in the Greek means to be, to, to be a restraining force. Uh, uh, only he that now uh, letteth will let will restrain until he be taken out of the way. So it's important to see this. And then when the Holy Spirit, the restraining force, releases his hold, and see when we go out, the Holy Spirit lives in us, and his work of restraining is going to be over. Right now he's restraining the forces of evil and wickedness, 
If he wasn't working in that, in that way today, you and I couldn't survive what's going on because we would have already been killed, I'm sure, because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he is the restrainer from all the evil that's going on. And then that wicked one, the word wicked there, actually in the Greek says wicked one, a person, the Antichrist shall be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now the Antichrist will, will have his time here on this earth for seven years. He's going to be Satan incarnate in human flesh, and he's going to do exactly like the Bible says it's going to happen. He's already pre-written written what's that going to come to pass. But when Jesus comes in great power and glory, Revelation chapter 19, he's going to consume the Antichrist and his forces with the word of his mouth. The Bible said that fire will be coming from his mouth. And so we, we're going to um, be able to uh, study more about this as we go on and finish the book of Daniel. Now, I hope that you have been blessed throughout this Daniel study because it's been one of the most important studies you could ever study about prophecy. Now, Father, as we close today, I want to thank you that we've had this time to talk about the 77s, uh, the time element involved in the, the Messiah's coming, the Messiah's crucifixion, and then, Lord, what's going to take place at the end of the church age. I want to thank you for all of this, and I pray your blessings on our study and our blessings, Lord, on our understanding. Give us wisdom and knowledge to understand the things that you've written in your word. And we're going to thank you, Lord, for everything you do. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now, thank you so much for coming today and being a part of the class. And Lord willing, we'll see you on next Tuesday.